We welcome everyone to this November 28th, 2022. You know, I wrote it all day long and I don't even remember the day. Uh, meeting of the Corsican ISD Board of Trustees. This is a regular meeting and all items that have, will be discussed have been duly posted. While this is a meeting in public, it is not a meeting of the public. If you wish to speak, please register in the lobby and the audience for guest form and follow the information on the speaker form. The board's role is to set goals, approve personnel and budgets, make policies, and provide oversight. We are not here to manage or solve individual problems. Management is responsibility of the superintendent. As a board, we believe that we must educate every child, provide every child the greatest opportunity to, to, opportunity to learn, and maintain a safe and secure environment mentally, physically, emotionally, and academically. And these are our core values. We appreciate your interest in the students of CISD. Okay, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance performed by Bowie Elementary. Come on up to the front. Oh, you can, no, use the mic. If you'd like to gather around the podium, you can use the mic. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. Nice job. Can y'all come up to the front, please? Come, come up. up. The... Yeah. And we're going to get your picture, and we're going to get you to shake hands with the board, okay? And me. Come on up here. Just make a straight line, and we're all going to have a picture. Come on, guys. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank y'all. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Now you got to start with Miss Kelly and shake hands with job. all the board Great members. Job. Great hey, job. There you Great go. Job. Great job. Good job. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Good job. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank y'all. Now we're going to have the invocation by Mr. Steve Hayes. Thank you all for having me tonight. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this board and for everyone in this room. And I just pray, God, that you would continue to use them to build a culture within uh, CISD of love, of care, of discipline, of community. I pray that you would make them unified uh, in their efforts. And I pray, God, that you would oversee um, all of their thinking, all of their thoughts, everything that they say and do and give them great wisdom and courage. Uh, thank you for what you're doing in our schools, God. Continue to bless our students and uh, let them know, each one of them, that they are dearly loved and valued and cherished. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <coughs> Raymond, was there any audience for guests, you know? Thank you. <laughs> We're missing Meryl. All right. Thank you, Raymond. All right. We're going to go into the superintendent's report. First, um, our latest edition of Roar. Of course, Canada ISD magazine is out. The cover feature. Um, has almost three dozen 
CHS graduates who have returned home to work in the district in various capacities. It also includes features on our, on our reigning teachers of the year, five new head coaches, the C and the CHS auto tech student Wyatt Ware who completed, competed in nationals as a junior. Despite being both young and rebuilding, the CHS boys and girls basketball teams have enjoyed some early season success. The girls open district play on December 13th at home, and the boys open district play on December 20th in Ennis. CHS senior Jack Allen recently won a state level competition for his short film entitled Stuck. How very appropriate. Mm -hmm. About a young man dealing with life staying at home during COVID. He has earned a spot in a national competition in June in Bloomington, Indiana. On Saturday, as part of the downtown holiday festivities, the district elementary and secondary choirs will present a, a Corsicana Christmas at the Palace Theater. It's scheduled to start at 2 p.m. and it's free to the public. Unwrapped toys and winter wear um, donations are encouraged. And the next thing we have a, a demo for, and I'm not sure who is in charge of that, Raymond. Okay, our ag services team has advanced. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the video first. Okay, um, the Fun Town Heritage RV Heritage Bowl is scheduled for noon Saturday at the Community National Bank and Trust Stadium. East Central University from Ada, Oklahoma, is facing Texas A&M Kingsville. The Calicos are assisting with stuffing swag bags Wednesday, and the two teams will participate in High Five Fridays at all of our campuses Friday morning. Additionally, we will have a CISD commercial airing during the national broadcast of the game, which Mr. Lennox will demo for you now. This is where initiative leads to innovation. Where character spurs personal growth. Where young tigers become tomorrow's leaders. Corsicana ISD. Every tiger, every day. Thank you. I think you did a really nice job with that video, so thank you so much. Thank you. And next, um, I want to congratulate our CHS Ag Services team for advancing to state and leadership development, a leadership development events competition. The team of Elaine Myers, Jake McSpadden, Braden Herman, Audrey Leibel, and Sarah Beck was second in the area event and will compete Friday at Sam Houston State University. Ad Advocacy placed fifth at area. So we want to ask these students to come forward and they are going to um, do their competition, um, perform their competition for you. already introduced them, uh, but the idea of this contest is that they present the pros and the cons to an agriculture issue, um, and then they're going to open it for questions at the end, and the judges can actually ask them anything they want on Friday. So if you guys have questions when they get done with the presentation, they would love to answer them for you. Um, I am going to preface with that Sarah and Audrey um, are the con side for this, and sometimes um, 
it comes off a little aggressive. So um, do not uh, think that they do not enjoy the farming community that we live in. However, they have to present as though they do not. So take it easy on them on the questions. Mix that in. <laughs> All right. Your farming and land use is ruining my neighborhood's atmosphere. It is a constant flow of land, air, and even sound pollution. My farmland is feeding your people, and clothing it for that matter. Thank God. Well, your friends across town are no better. They are constantly using chemicals and fertilizers that are ruining my lawn and my personal garden. And let's talk about the effect that this is having on my children. Excuse me, Miss Becky and Miss Lyle, but your homes and neighborhoods were built long after these farms and ranches were started in the Barrow County. Perhaps you are the problem okay, here. Okay, guys, sorry I'm late. I think everyone might need to go ahead and separate before this gets out of hand. Miss Myers and Jake, why don't you come over here? And Miss Becky and Miss Lyle, to my left, please. And let's talk about this calm. Good afternoon, and welcome to Corsicana Town Hall. Today's topic of discussion is Texas Agriculture Code, Section 251, or the rights of farm law and how it affects the U.S., Texas, and most importantly, Navarro County agriculture. Right to farm is no new law, but it is seeing opposition across the country as urban land continues to grow. My name is Braden Herman, and I'm the Navarro County Secretary and serving as your mediator between community members. The right to farm statute found in Texas Agriculture Code Section 251 was enacted by Texas legislature in 1981 and has been sustained ever since. The purpose of this statute is to conserve, protect, and encourage the development and improvement of agriculture land for the production of food and other agriculture products. More specifically, it limits the circumstances in which an agricultural operation may be considered to be a nuisance. This law applies to all agricultural operations, which includes cultivating the soil, producing crops for human food, animal feed, planting seed or fiber, raising livestock or poultry, producing cover crops or leaving land idle for crop rotation, and much more. The Texas Right to Farm Statute provides that no nuisance claim may be brought against an agriculture operation so long as the conditions complained have not changed since the day of the establishment. As urban areas continue to grow and get closer to the farmland that surrounds them, homeowners associations, city officials, and many residents are balking at the idea of having their family, property, and pets exposed to the aspects of the farming industry. And a rift is arising between the farmers and ranchers and the general public. I would like to take a moment and allow representatives to, to introduce themselves. Representing those in our community in favor of the current right to farm law are Elaine Myers and Jake McSpadden. Thank you, Braden. My name is Elaine Myers. I'm a lawyer who specializes in agriculture law, specifically in the laws that impact the ability of farmers and ranchers to maintain their business, like eminent domain and right to farm laws. My name is Jake McSpadden, and I'm a third generation farmer here in Avera County. It has not always been this way, but my farm now backs up to several houses and even a gated community. Speaking on behalf of those opposed to right to farm law are Sarah Beck and Audrey Leibel. My name is Audrey Lavell, and I am the president of the Homeowners Association for the gated community that backs up to Mr. McSpadden's land. I am here to voice my community's concerns. And my name is Sarah Beck, and I live on the opposite side of town from Ms. Lavell, but a mere 15 yards away from another farmer here in town. I am the mother of three young children, a puppy, and no personal garden, and I have some concerns as well. You have all made your passion and the fact that you have concerns very clear earlier today, and I'm happy to give each of you the floor to speak in a civilized manner, and there are a lot of community members here ready to listen. The only question we have now is if Texas Agriculture Code Section 251 is right to farm or right to harm. It is undebatable that without agriculture, we would all go hungry. The farmers of America feed not only our country and state, but the entire world. What people tend to forget is that agriculture is the leading producer of clothing, shelter, and even medicine. Agriculturalists are already losing the battle when it comes to land, and right to farm is not something we can afford to lose. In 1935, there were 6.8 million farms. That number has dropped to roughly 2 million. Farmland itself has decreased by 31 million acres, roughly the size of New York State over the last 20 years. Meanwhile, the population is growing by 83 million people per year. 
As the population and demand for food continues to rise, it is essential that these farmers and ranchers are able to continue their operations. Those opposed to the right to farm law are making a request that makes this impossible. Examples of these requests include only farming between certain times of day, limited to no use of pesticides and herbicides, and even stating that the height or side of the crop is disrupting their view. Ranchers are facing similar complaints as residents complain of air and noise pollution from animals. It is simply not feasible to expect for a farmer or rancher not to use pesticides and herbicides for it is essential for a successful crop. It is also important that time not be limited since weather already permits so much. The concerns pointed out by residents are not a vain request. Right to farm and the farms and ranches it is protecting are negatively affecting the health and well-being of the residents, our families, and even our pets. Farms and ranches close to town expose us to chemicals and water pollution. Chemicals can damage the human and animal immune system through ingestion, inhaling, and even touching. In fact, in order for a farmer to buy or use these chemicals, they must be trained and certified in pesticide application. They must also ensure that there are no other people or animals around. But what about my family on the other side of the fence? And some people are just more vulnerable to pesticide impacts. Infants and young children, for example. Short-term acute health effects include stinging eyes, rashes, dizziness, and diarrhea. More chronic long-term effects include cancer, birth defects, reproductive harm, neurological toxicity, and even death. The biggest issue with pesticide poisoning is that those symptoms mimic those of the cold or the flu. <coughs> Since these poisonings appear so similar to other illnesses, it is oftentimes misdiagnosed or missed completely. This means that those acute symptoms go untreated and quickly turn into long-term issues. The need for food in America is clear, but I also see the issue of going to protect a healthier family. What else should we share with our community members? Did you know the average farmer only makes around $37,000 a year after they pay what it takes to maintain their farm? Ranchers do make slightly more than about $55,000 a year, but they ultimately get paid even less than a teacher. Farmers and ranchers cannot afford legal fees when they are already struggling in today's economy so much. First and foremost, farmers like Jake should not be having to fight for something that is already the law. Farmers and ranchers already face the fear of eminent domain and losing their water rights for the betterment of the public as a whole. This is just one more thing that they have to fight to keep their land and their livelihood safe. It could cost upwards of $200,000 to fight these suits filed. The problem with the nuisance claims is that even if a farmer or rancher can prove they have been in effect prior to the nuisance lawsuit, they're still having to pay to prove it. They have to pay an attorney to write process and file a summary judgment costing about thirty thousand dollars even worse than that when a suit makes it to trial because it will those costs for a defense attorney and experts are going to jump significantly most attorneys charge at least five hundred dollars an hour and the cost all the way through trial will quickly surpass one hundred thousand dollars we are already asking these farmers and ranchers to feed billions of people and now are we going to take their financial resources away too? While we are on the subject of money, let's talk about how farms and ranches so close to town are decreasing the property value of residents on the edge of town. The base definition of property value is what someone is willing to pay in comparison to what the buyer is willing to accept. New builds such as Audrey's gated community and my neighborhood generally have a higher property value than that of older homes. However, this is proven to be untrue for homes that are in closer proximity to farm and ranch operations. There are three main causes that affect property value. The housing market, natural disasters, and the neighborhood. A prime example of how property value can change in a matter of days is when housed next to these operations or when your home backs up to a dairy cattle operation. Maybe your fence can block it from view, but that doesn't mean it goes unnoticed. On top of the sound and air pollution you face, the chance of ground pollution from waste runoff as well. One unexpected downpour and the runoff of dairy is going into your yard. After the storm, you may face a dead or damaged yard, water pollution, 
and likely some fence damage. This instantly drops the value of your home, and it is only one example. Don't even get me started on the visual and sound pollution these operations impose on our neighborhoods. Again, lowering the value. I think we probably have time for each shot one more time, if you guys have another point to make. Oh, we most certainly do. I know we all seem stuck on the money, but let's face it, it is what makes the world go round. Farms and ranches are a huge part of maintaining the economy, even during low economic times. When it comes down to it, we always have to eat and have employees to work to make that happen. Agriculture is the leading source of jobs in the United States. Though not all those jobs are production agriculture like farms and ranches, they do make up a large portion. Farms and ranches contribute to over $1 trillion to the U.S. gross domestic product, 5% of the total. Texas farms and ranches contribute $134.5 billion of this all on their own. Along with the city's economy, local farms and ranches are a huge contributor to the youth of the county. They provide them with summer and part-time jobs, and they also support their participation in the local youth <coughs> expo. Now this boosts the economy, but more importantly, boosts the next generation of agriculturalists to feed the world. Elaine, you make a good point. Feeding the world is no easy task. In fact, many Americans are actually taking it upon themselves create their own home gardens to ensure that they are able to feed themselves and their families. Farmers and ranchers are not considerate of the fact that their crops may not be the only thing growing close to their fields and causing damage to personal gardens and horticulture plants. Correct. Many crops have treated seed that protect them from the use of herbicides such as Roundup Ready Cotton. But this is not the case for many homegrown gardens. If a farmer were to carelessly spray his cotton on a windy day or simply apply too much, it would not only damage any resident's grass, but any small-scale crops they were growing as well. Similarly, ranchers often have livestock that imposes damage on surrounding land. We are completely aware that these are animals, and they don't know any better. But the rancher certainly does. Sometimes these animals get out and destroy lawns, trees, and even fences. I think it's pretty obvious that you could all continue to tell us your side of the rice farm issue, but we are out of time and I'm pretty sure audience members may have some questions. In summary, Elaine and Jake are in favor of the current right to farm law. Agriculture is the leading producer in food, fiber, medicine, and shelter in the USA today. Farmers and ranchers are already fighting a battle to feed a growing population with a shrinking number of farms. Farmers cannot afford to be fighting for a law that is already in place. The minimum fee for an attorney is about $30,000, and it can be upwards of almost $200,000. And lastly, farmers and ranchers do not only contribute to the economy in the country, but also a small town America. They contribute to the workforce, food supply, and even the next generation of agriculturalists. Simply, the right to farm law was put into place to protect these farmers and ranchers from the intrusion of city residents into their daily operations. And we cannot afford to lose any more land or any more rights for the agriculture industry. Opposed to the right to farm law are Sarah Beck and Audrey Leibel. Farms and ranches so close to town are affecting the health and safety of me, my family, and even my pets. Farmers and ranchers use chemicals that are unsafe to ingest, inhale, and even touch in some cases. Agriculture operations decrease property value for homes closer to farms and ranches. Farmers and ranchers introduce air, ground, and even sound pollution into neighborhoods. Farmers and ranchers use chemicals that damage personal gardens and other ornamental plants alike. Personal gardens are not planted with treated seed like many other crops. Ultimately, the proximity between farms and ranches is putting our families at risk and ruining our property. The current population of the United States is somewhere around 329.5 million people, and Avera County alone has over 49,000 of those residents. One thing cannot be argued. We need agriculture to survive. What limits should be set on those agriculturalists as town and country creep closer together? Right to Farm has been in effect since 1981 to keep the farmers and ranchers of Texas from residential restrictions. But is the law so appropriate for the America we live in today? It is clear that Americans are concerned with feeding their families, keeping them healthy, and the value of their property, both residential and farmland. But the real question still stands. Is Texas Agriculture Code Section 251 
right to farm, or right to harm. Thank you, we're now open to questions. All right, I'll ask a question. This is near and dear to my heart. Why don't you move? Because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example. Before World War II, 25% of the average soldier who entered in World War II was a farmer. Now we're less than 2% of the U.S. population is a farmer. It's actually, they think it could be less than a half of a percent. Output has quadrupled since World War II because of said pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. How do you suggest feeding a country that's growing faster than we're taking the land? So one reason that a lot of people like Audrey and I are moving to these areas is because the population is going to continue to increase. And so the only solution, honestly, to that is to move it into the farmland. And a lot of people are buying these houses because the realtor is selling them as a pretty view and people just like the look of the house. However, when they're buying, when they're actually living in it, that's when they face a lot of the complaints because they don't know what the farming industry looks like, and they they just unfortunately don't look into what they're buying before they buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and opposed to that, um, in a county like Navarro, we can't afford to lose any more farmland. In our county alone, it's close to 40 to 45 percent that is involved with in agriculture. And every time that these homeowners associations or even residents come in and invade this land, they're offering them money that they just can't turn down. Because either their crop wasn't as successful as they wanted it to, or simply it's way more money than they've ever made. And so it's very hard for them to turn it down. And that's why we are facing so many problems with the right to farm law. Thank you. So when you see like, like Dallas, up north, and you see that now, everything's land like that way, so everything's coming this way. So now you see when you got a driving for you, you see that you got that driving, but <laughs> when you're on 45 and you see all the houses that's, that's being built up and all that's coming this way, so what is your thoughts on, like you said, Navarro County, do you, do you, as young people, do you envision that, hey, the land is going to be taken over eventually? So what is your thoughts on that? We do, both sides. We do see that eventually, as Sarah was saying, the population is going to grow. So we do have to come up with a solution. And one thing that we're arguing is that there need to, needs to be more education on what the farming industry can have on these residents especially, whether it be having uh, real estate agents go through training or whether it be just residents in general being more educated through the city council meetings. There just truly needs to be uh, more of a widespread knowledge of what's truly going on. And there are classes that people can take that are specifically for things like this. And they, like the Cattle Raisers Association puts on a webinar for this, strictly for this reason, for more education about this topic. And I, don't, I don't know if this will help you or not, but you know, um, one of the things that my dad was the president of the Farm Service Agency in Anderson County for years. And one of the things they always talked about was how Europe always backs their farmers, always backs their farmers. And they, those countries have starved to death. They, they, and they remember it, right? They remember starving. And so America really hasn't known starvation since the 30s. So there's not a lot of people around since the survived the Great Depression. So, I mean, I don't know if that helps y'all this or, the, or whatever, but uh, just remember that, that other countries they they move up. Uh, they don't let people go out into, into their farmland. So, I don't know if that, that helps you or not. Yeah, and that right to farm law, it really does not protect the farmer at all. It basically just says, you know, if you're going to change your operation within a year of these residents moving in, they could potentially open a lawsuit and then pretty much have their convenience take over your livelihood. Mm -hmm. mm. We all did a great job. We Thank want you. to congratulate you again. I, I have
have one question. I know absolutely nothing about farming, although now I do. But my ri what I do know about is, has Miss Bain and Miss Kasperzik come to see this? Because they're going to steal all these kids for yeah, drama. Yeah. These are your future drama kids right here. Do y'all like? Do you need to be in one act? They need y'all in the plays. And good luck on Friday. Yes. 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 Good luck. Rachel. We sure do thank y'all. Thank you, Miss Johnson. Like I say, good luck on Friday. Let us know how you do. All right, we're going to move right along into the gifted and talented program report. Good afternoon, Mr. President, distinguished school board members, and Dr. Frost. We're so excited to be here today uh, to bring to you our gifted and talented update for the 2022-2023 school year. My name is Jennifer Farmer, and I am the district uh, gifted and talented coordinator. And I would also like to introduce to you two uh, of our amazing gifted and talented teachers. Mrs. Kayla Simmington. She works with our elementary students and also Mrs. Kathy Ware, which is new with us this year, and she works with our fifth and sixth grade students. So we're excited to be here. Our uh, annual Gifted and Talented, we kicked off the year with our Parent Information Night, and at that we had over 100 participants of uh, people in attendance. Uh, we've been very proud of the growth of our Gifted and Talented program, and our numbers are growing with our students every year. Part of that is last year we implemented the Nagliari General Ability Test, and this test is something that I'm extremely passionate about. The test itself includes verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative uh, tests. Where they're specifically designed to be both culturally and linguistically non-biased, and that was huge for me. The testing system focuses more on how students think and less about what they know. Some of the systems we used in the past, although they're great systems, you had to have experiences to do well on them, and so this testing system really helps to see how a child thinks. And it shows. We test all kindergarten and fourth grade students for the entire district. And this year, our first grade students, which were our kindergartners last year, were at 62 students in first grade. And our fourth graders that are now fifth graders, we are at 84 students. So you can see that the testing system has really uh, gained new prospects for our gifted and talented program. Our design of the gifted and talented program, we were extremely excited to go back to our old way of the kids actually go to a campus together. Uh, after COVID, we started servicing them on their campuses just to help keep them from moving around too much. But we are back to uh, first through fourth grade is half a day at Fannin Elementary each week. 
fifth and sixth is on campus at Collins Intermediate for one hour every day. Seventh and eighth is GT advisory courses uh, with our GT specialist. We have four GT teachers at the seventh grade level and two at the eighth grade level. Those are uh, GT advisory courses and the students also have the opportunity to be a part of pre-AP as well. In ninth through 12th grade, they have the options of pre-AP, AP, CTE courses, electives, and dual credit. Our GT state plan, we follow the state on gifted and talented and we use their Texas performance projects to help support that. Our fall projects are in first grade, the seven elements of art, and you'll get to see some of our first graders today. Second grade, extreme weather and natural disasters. Third grade is treehouse amusement park. Fourth is produce a TV sitcom. Fifth grade, taco truck challenge. Sixth grade, culture shock. Seventh grade, we are the world and tell a tale of a trail. And eighth grade is the pursuit of passion and Corsicana future city project. In the spring, we move to uh, also do, so they get two projects a year. In the spring, first grade does plan a camp out. Second grade, mad scientist. Third grade is the lunar mission. Fourth grade, game on, level up. Fifth grade is resource revolution. Sixth grade, products in motion. Seventh grade, tell a tale of a trail and we are the world. So they trade halfway through the year. And eighth grade, Corsicana, future city project and the pursuit of passion. During Gifted and Talented, we are reinforcing writing skills. Something that is very important is for students to find their inner self, and many times through their reinforcement of writing, it helps to build who they are, who their voice is from inside to out. These are some of our projects. So twice a year we have a fall showcase and we also do a spring showcase. So I, we just wanted to bring to you some of the pictures from our fall and spring showcases this year, or this past year. It was actually the 2021-2 year. can see it's everything from the taco truck. This is the um, treehouse amusement park. This is game on level up. So it just gives you a good idea and our parents and community members are invited to be a part of the projects. Huge part of it is uh, we are wanting the students to present and be as great as the FFA students are once they get to high school, right? So that is our goal as well. I have in front of you an invitation for our showcases for the fall and uh, you are completely invited anyone in the community we have it on our website and also social media uh, our gifted and talented fall showcases are coming up elementary will be at drain and collins will be at collins now we would like to bring the seven elements of art we would now like to introduce some of our very own CISD first graders.
everything I have to up. What else do you want to tell about Pablo Picasso? It's really interesting. Do you remember how many names Pablo Picasso has? How many? 23 names. 23 names. It's actually a little
it just like they just flew through it. We wanted it to be fun because we didn't think that it would be just the game of the day. They tell us about what's going to be going on in this game. Thank you, man. His evil brother was trying to, he like trapped him in a 
it does done Okay, and he's trying to escape. So I since that's fire, I made it where he killed it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I can't leave, so I can go to pick up the key. Thank you. 
Thank you all very much. We really appreciate that. Services. 
We're going to ask Mr. Reese to come up and um, follow these student presentations with his <laughs> riveting discussions of air conditioning I units and rooftops. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. We've come a long way since Commodore 64, so. <laughs> We're tapping on those keyboards. Uh, we have a presentation. I think it's is it there. We do have a hard copy in our in board book, but you will need one to speak from, won't you? Um, Meryl's not here, so that's probably our problem. Here, here, I can, here. I can give you one. Yeah. Sure. We have the full printout in board book. Okay. That's enough, Bob. I, yeah, I can use this. This is fine. Uh, thank you, guys, for having me. I'm John Reese. I'm business development manager for no, Formal you. Services here in Texas. Uh, this is my lead engineer, Cy Danison, and we're going to talk to you about what we our findings as we walk through the district uh, buildings and uh, admin locations to take a look at you guys from an energy efficiency standpoint. And so. Just a little bit about performance services. Uh, we were started back in 1998 out of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, really started as a K through 12 energy services company. Our owner had worked for two larger ESCOs and found that he could kind of do things uh, a little bit better way, a little bit cheaper way, and a little more transparent with our customer base. And so uh, we do guaranteed energy, guaranteed energy savings contracts, which is all tied in through government legislation, which we'll talk about later. We also do uh, design build in the public sector as well as uh, referendum uh, help or anything of that nature that you guys will need to, to try and generate some more income or funds. Um, 145 Energy Star buildings we've certified. We've got about 260 employees throughout nine states here, predominantly in the Midwest, down from uh, Indiana through Texas and Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri. And that is our building. We actually built it in uh, Round Rock a few years ago. I've been in Texas for about seven years. So from a K through 12 and municipal standpoint, here's just a list of some of our customers. Uh, one of our largest K through 12 customers is Austin ISD. Uh, we're actually looking at doing a phase two with them. Uh, Laverne and Poth are pretty unique. We actually helped them go out and get uh, referendums uh, passed. And so they, they chose us to do the design and build work for them. One of them was to relocate a gymnasium and the other one was to add some uh, power generation and uh, increase the lighting at, at one of their football stadiums. During COVID, we had to kind of pivot our business. So with K through 12 being shut down, we moved more to the municipality side and started doing a lot of water projects. And so uh, City of Fairfield, City of Beeville, we're actually doing a second phase with them and a wastewater treatment facility. It's about a $20 million deal. Uh, City of Kaufman, we just got awarded Texas Facilities Commission uh, to do some state buildings for the state of Texas here uh, moving shortly. So. I mentioned legislation. Everything is tied through code uh, 44.901, which basically states that a district can enter into an energy savings performance contract if that uh, energy savings is either cash flow neutral or positive. And so essentially, the uh, project has to help pay for itself. Uh, we like to use TIPS as a procurement method because they've done all the heavy lifting. They, you know, we have to certify with them uh, once every couple of years, and so it's just a lot easier. We can do job order contracts. We can do the energy savings performance contracts. We can do it all through, through TIPS. It takes about 10 minutes to, to sign up. As far as delivery method, uh, we take a look at Corsicana ISD as a whole, and everything that you see underneath you guys, we take care of. And so uh, no pointing the fingers, total transparency. We have uh, open book pricing policy. We also have a no change order policy as a company. And so if we make a mistake, we eat it. You guys will never see it. But we take care of everything underneath from project design, project management, uh, performance assurance, performance assurance, any controls, outlook, uh, any mechanical, electrical subcontractors. Uh, we get at least three bids on each. And so we try to use local as much as possible because those are your constituents and those are the guys that are paying taxes in your community. And so. Uh, first and foremost, we try to give them the opportunity. As far as the process itself, uh, basically we take a look at your energy costs, the UMNO costs, water energy savings, and right now you're paying a lot of money to your utilities. You've got HVAC systems that are 40 plus years old, you've got uh, water conservation issues and your sinks and toilets, you've got roofing issues, and so um, entering into a project that's going to create a new net revenue, obviously the equipment, all that needs to be paid for, but I'm going to show a little bit of savings here to help you guys pay for pay down that project. 
So we took a look at your utilities and I think we're a little bit light as we looked at 2018 to about 2021. I think there was some COVID related hangover from there. Uh, and so the numbers that you're gonna see are pretty conservative. Uh, we think that uh, once we do a deeper dive into the utility spend that uh, it'll, it'll offer a lot more savings than what we're projecting here today. So on the next slide, uh, as far as the, the scope of work, we took a look at your HVAC systems district-wide. Um, a lot of these systems are running on R22, which is no longer available and legal. Um, talking to your staff, your facility staff, and Ben and Brad, uh, and several months you guys have paid over $12,000 just to get R22, R22 if they can find it. If not, they're trying to look at other me uh, measures as far as adding new compressors and things of that nature, which are costly. Uh, of the staff of four that's in charge of HVAC, they're all basically just chasing leaks and things of that nature, trying to fix repairs. They're really not doing the normal work order stuff. And so a lot of that income that's going towards that is just spent on you guys chasing, chasing uh, leaks and uh, defects and uh, failures. So the new refrigerant is R410A. It's a lot more friendly to the environment. Uh, it's a lot more readily available. And then the HVAC, HVAC units themselves, I mean, you look at the bottom left, those units are from like 1989. <laughs> so I'm surprised, though, you know, looking at the manufacturer going, wow, I need to put these in my house. <laughs> they've, lasted, they've lasted this long. Uh, you're not able to track a lot of the uh, units as well. As you look at the wall stats there, you know, today's technology will allow you even on a cell phone to take a look and see, you know, how that uh, system is being utilized and how it's performing. You guys don't have that capability right now in about 50% of your units. And then the units on the high school, that's one of them there, they're, they're completely shot. There's been a few replacements, kind of one-off, uh, as you can find uh, product, but for the most part, the majority of those, I think there's 500 and... 12 or 13 and 437 need to be replaced. And so, good big number. Um, Dr. Frost asked me to kind of break down the HVAC replacement unit quantity as well as the Wi Fi thermostats. The reason being is that uh, Ben and his staff have been replacing the, the thermostats with Wi Fi stats as they can find them, they become available. And so, if you look at the high school, like the high school and the middle school, it's all pretty much new as far as the, the controls are, are concerned. And so we didn't put those in the numbers, but um, it's a pretty heavy lift for 400 plus units, about $13 million in cost. Um, Wi-Fi thermostat replacement cost of what's left, uh, looking at about 140,000. And then we can save you 50,000 per, per year on that. So the next scope was the lighting. And we really just looked at I guess you guys did a lighting project with E3 some years ago, five or six years ago. And so from a, from a school standpoint, the only ones that really need to be addressed are drained. And I know you're still trying to figure out what to do with that campus. And also the uh, athletic field. So the football stadium, the baseball stadium, the softball stadium, the tennis courts, things of that nature have not been done. You guys are using metal highlights right now, are really costly. You know, they take a, a long while to heat up, so they come on. So if you've, you've got a football or soccer game or something, then you have to go out an hour ahead of time and turn them on so they get to heat up. Uh, ben and his staff are replacing the bulbs one off, which is pretty expensive and costly. And then you got to get someone to hire boom trucks. They can get off the lift and climb up the pole. And if you've ever been on one of those, those poles don't stop moving. <laughs> so <laughs> commend the guys for getting up there. And then we noticed in drain you can see the different coloration of the lights there uh, a lot of those lights are, are fluorescents and uh, either burned out and offering very poor light quality and so we'd like to take a look at that as well if you decide that you want to move that that route uh, next on the list was the plumbing so from a water conservation standpoint you guys have got really old toilet sinks urinals uh, if you look at the bottom picture there the uh, second urinal from the right i believe is that in drain that's in drain. Uh, ben was saying that that thing's been running for six straight years. So well, it was running the whole time we were there. It never shuts off. And so you're losing a lot of water uh, based off of that. And then a lot of your fixtures are older fixtures with uh, higher flow or standard flow. Now we move to the low flow sinks and toilets with uh, sensors on them to turn themselves off and things of that nature. You kind of take the human area element out of uh, the, the technology or with the technology. Uh, the next was just your walk-in coolers, and this is something that we just kind of recommend. We noticed a couple of them, the, the, the doors were partially open, but the freezer was still on, and you know, cold air was blowing out, and so we'd like to put a little bit more controls on those, and so you could tell 
ahead of time before something was going out. And if something went out on a Friday, you know, you weren't back until Monday, then you have an opportunity to to lose food and things of that nature. And so, uh, and it's not a whole lot, it not, doesn't add a whole lot of cost to the project itself, but gives you that added level of context or uh, confidence of knowing when and if those uh, materials are going to fail. And then I think lastly was the uh, roofing. So the high school roof and drain roof really need to be replaced, uh, drain especially, but the high school roof, we think that there may be an opportunity to repair some of it. It is a uh, built up gravel roof and you can see in the picture here that you guys have been chasing leaks. They brushed the gravel away to try to find leaks and there's several ponding areas of standing water there which is not efficient um, and rumors of several leaks there inside the high school. And so we would, we didn't add that to our overall numbers because we actually, if you're interested in doing that, we want to have someone come out and walk it. We've got several roofing companies that uh, specialize in, in K through 12 market that we could bring out and give you guys a, a quote. I don't want to tell you that you have a new roof if you don't need a new roof. If, if we have a, a means of getting it to last another 15 years or so, then we, we'd like to do that. So from a UCL matrix standpoint, um, we didn't look at the middle school because it's fairly new. Uh, the high school had some controls and HVAC and things of that nature that were already done. And so uh, from a power conditioning standpoint, and this is something that we like to do anytime you're changing out light bulbs or HVAC systems, it just allows you to monitor the uh, output of uh, all of your appliances and all your equipment, your computers and things of that nature. So the, the microwave in the teacher's lounge isn't drawing too much ampage uh, unnecessarily and pulling from other units. It also protects if there's a lightning strike. And so anytime we're doing anything electrical, we like to add that. And again, it doesn't add a whole lot of cost to the, to the project. Uh, LED lighting at drain and also the, the ball fields at the high school. Uh, HVAC roof, play, uh, roof replacements everywhere from uh, the admin center down to the high school. Again, everything aside from the middle school. Uh, plumbing retrofits, your Wi-Fi stats, and then your cooler. We did talk about solar PV as an option. We do have an in-house solar team, and so we understand you guys have some land, and so there's an uh, Inflation Reduction Act that's been signed through our government that will allow the government to pay up to 30% of the total cost of that system, and so it really brings your return of investment way down, but that's something that we could talk about at a different phase or a different time. And then again, the roofing repair and the general generator, we could uh, source those items for you as well. So from a cost standpoint, um, you're currently paying a little over a million dollars a year in your energy. Uh, we think we can save you about 15% on that. And these are conservative numbers. Again, guys, we'd have to do a deep dive uh, and really take a look at 2022 numbers and see where, where you actually are. But total project cost of, of 15 million, uh, payback of 14 years, which is pretty good. The um, legislation allows us to finance out to 20 years. And so, we do have several finance partners. I actually contacted one. They're familiar with you guys. And uh, the numbers that we show on the project cash flow, the next slide, are actually real numbers. And so for $15 million, I, I believe there's $3 million mentioned of ESSER funds left that can buy down that rate. 20-year uh, finance term, interest rate of 4.9%, which is pretty current. Just got that uh, com uh, confirmed about two days ago. Uh, we do have measurement verification costs. So uh, one thing I think I failed to mention is this guaranteed energy savings project. Anything we tell you we're going to save, we have to guarantee, and that's in writing. And that's all verified through a third-party engineer that's not associated with us, not associated with you. There's about six or eight of them here in Texas. We can give you their names, and it's up to you guys to uh, get them involved. But um, so if I tell you I'm going to save you this $5.5 million over 20 years, if in any one of those years we fall short, i got to cut you a check to make you whole. So if we're saying a million dollars or what are we saying here, you know, three, four hundred thousand a year, if I'm, if I'm 200 short, i got to cut you a check for the other two. So it's all tied through legislation. So if you look at the next cash flow side, uh, looking at year really seven, uh, becomes cumulative, a net benefit there. And you know, that's once the equipment is starting to be paid off and uh, you get more into the principal instead of the interest. But the last, last page here is just the, some next steps. So we're, we've done a preliminary analysis. So the next stage would be an investment grade audit. Uh, it's a lot more in depth. We actually bring in contractors, whether it be mechanical, electrical, water, have them compete for the business. You know, all those go directly to you. It takes 
about 90 to 120 days with the holidays to get that done, get that accomplished. And so we're looking at somewhere, I think we can get it done by March. And we'll put Cy on the hook here and say, yeah, Cy can get it done by March. <laughs> so we'll come back to you guys for board approval. Uh, anticipating that sometime early April and uh, be ready to move out and get everything going by summertime, which would be, I think, ideal for you guys as students are out of school, and things of that nature. Now, there's a caveat that supply chain issues are rampant. <laughs> so we really have to take a look at what's available from an HVAC standpoint. I can tell you that the buying power of buying 400 plus units it carries a lot of weight as opposed to trying to do them as a one-off. And so we would uh, put our best foot forward and work with you guys on the vendor of choice. If there were three that wanted to compete for the business and we'd get those quotes for you and let you guys decide on who you guys wanted to use. Uh, there is a back out fee associated with the investment grade audit. We're gonna spend a lot more than $38,000, but we just ask that if we find a project that makes sense and, and fits the legislation, and for some reason you guys decide not to move forward, now that you'd help us off with help us out with those development costs. And so, again, we're not. I think I mentioned before we're not in the business of selling IGAs. We'd rather have the business, but uh, we would like some help if, for some reason, you guys decide not to move forward. So, without that, I'll open it up for questions if you guys have it. You know, I got my tech guys. If you guys are technical, we can answer those. But. Had you guys had time to go through the presentation before? Did you? Okay. You know, I just want to make one comment, and that is that at the next board meeting, we'll have, we're going to receive a demographer's report, so we'll know a little bit more about what our enrollment um, is going to look like, and we'll be able to know some more things about, well, just have a stronger conversation about what happens with drain, what the utilization needs to be. I mean, right now we have DAP, we have several offices over there, we have the wraparound center, so we're utilizing the building, um, but we really don't have students there other than DAP, and we don't know what the future might hold for our enrollment numbers, but we'll know a little bit more about that at the next board meeting. But, you know, this is really um, an opportunity for us to look at our buildings and analyze where we are. Um, look at what we're going to be needing in the future. Um, some of the numbers on air conditioning units are, are pretty shocking. We just had all four units go out on top of the main gym at the high school, and we were really, really fortunate that we were able to get two in. Wow. Um, and for those two units, it was a total cost of about $60,000 because wow. it's everything from the units themselves, the installation and renting the cranes and those sort of things. So we were just so happy to find two air conditioning right. units. So that supply chain issue is, well, they told us about six months yeah, on AC system. units. Yeah. So this is um, very timely <coughs> and uh, a lot of information to, to take in, but we've got to look at enrollment projections and mm -hmm. we've got to look at just what we can afford. Okay. So thank yeah, you. Does anybody have any questions for them? No. Hey, thank you all for coming. Yes. You're giving us a lot to think thank about. Thank you so much. All right. So, Dr. Frost is going to do the first reading for us. Um, I'm filling in for Ms. Howell, who is, um, would love to be here, but she is ill tonight. So what this does is it modifies three policies, um, CO, COA, and COB local. And has to do, all three of these have to do with food services. Um, CISD is a community eligibility provision district, which means that all of our students receive breakfast and lunch free. So what it allows us to do is to um, utilize, um, for example, at breakfast, if our students have apples and not all the students want to eat their apples, they can put them on a, a spot. Um, there's a process and then if somebody else wants to take the apple um, and take it home with them or something or to eat it there for lunch, they can have access to that food. Um, COA um, allows a director of child nutrition to oversee and use the, um, the funds and to develop the necessary processes for um, purchasing the foods that we use. And then in COB, it just says that we will provide regular meal services to students at no cost as authorized by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It just continues that process for us. So this is these are information tonight, and um, with your permission, we'll put these on the consent agenda. Unless you have questions or any, need any more information, we'll put these in the consent agenda um, as action items at the next board meeting. No good? Mm -hmm. All right. 
next we have the consent agenda. Do I hear, I hear a motion? The consent agenda. I have a second. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The ayes have it, and we've approved the consent agenda. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go into closed session. Permitted by Texas Governance Code 551.01. Thank you.